Hello, Sunday School teachers. Uh, hopefully my last video for a while on my phone. My laptop is in the shop, and they say it'll be ready next week. Uh, we'll see if the camera even works after they get done with it. There's there's bigger issues with the charging cable, but enough about my problems. So let's talk about this wonderful Sunday School lesson. I love this story. It's uh, not a real well-known story, a uh, little narrative at the end of the Book of Acts, not always taught in Sunday School. I'm glad that we're getting this story here. There's a lot of good stuff here. It's a, what I think is a great allegory. Now, you have to be careful with allegories. First thing, what is an allegory? Uh, English teachers, this is our bread and butter here. And An allegory is a story where the elements of the story stand for something else. So famously, Aesop's fables are allegories where you have like the fox stands for a greedy person or something like that. Uh, the parable of the sower is, uh, in the Bible, an allegory where Jesus says this seed stands for this kind of person and this seed stands for another kind of person. What about allegories? Now, that parable of the sower is an easy one because Jesus tells us the allegory. Other stories in the Bible don't tell us an allegory. We just have to kind of figure it out, which is dangerous, right? If you get it wrong, uh, you can do some harm in misinterpreting the Bible. And so that's why Bible teachers have always been, well, there was a time in the early church when they tended to kind of allegorize everything, and then they, they corrected for that and maybe even overcorrected for it. You know, Luther was, he was always warning against allegorizing scripture, and then he would turn around and allegorize scripture in his interpretations of the Bible. So um, there, there's larger discussions here about how to interpret the Bible. You know, if we come to an allegory, we interpret it wrongly. As long as we're consistent with the doctrine through the rest of the scripture, we're not doing a whole lot of harm. So I'm going to allegorize this thing, because I, I see a great allegory here. Whether that's what Luke intended, what the Holy Spirit intended or not, I guess I can't say with 100% certainty, but I will say that everything I tell you is consistent with the doctrine taught throughout the rest of the Bible. So that's kind of one of our, our standard principles. So let's talk a little bit about this story. Let, let's, and, and also, I don't want to suggest that Luke is making this up. He's just narrating an event that really happened. He's talking about a real shipwreck. But as he's narrating this event, I see um, that it stands in and symbolizes larger stuff going on. So this really happened, but I also think it's telling a larger story, too. So let's let's start with the, the kind of the, the nitty gritty of what's happening. Paul is on a boat to Rome. The reason he's on a boat to Rome is because he has a legal case he's enmeshed in. He is a Roman citizen, very serious charges that could result in his death. And as a Roman citizen, he's able to appeal part of the due process. He gets to appeal all the way to the top. He gets to go uh, try his case before Caesar in Rome before the emperor of the entire Roman world. And this is not a privilege, of course, that everybody gets. You have to be a citizen. Not everybody born in the Roman Empire is a citizen. Not like America. You're born in America, you're a citizen. Far from it in, in Rome. Jesus was not a Roman citizen. He didn't get this due process. But Paul is born with citizenship. Uh, how and why? We don't know the details. Um but he certainly makes use of his citizenship throughout his, his calling as a missionary. And so he's on his way to Rome to be tried by Caesar, or to have his case heard before Caesar. Uh, this is not just a prisoner ship. There are prisoners. You know, they're not just going to send prisoners. That costs money to go from all the way to Rome. they got a ways to go. So they're going to try to basically hitch a ride on a ship that's already going to Rome. And so there's this cargo ship that's going to Rome. they got all kinds, there's people on the ship, all kinds of merchants, people who want to sell stuff in Rome. There's soldiers, perhaps some soldiers just going to Rome as part of the normal back and forth uh, of soldiers. And some of them are, are guarding the prisoners who are on their way to Rome. So all kinds of stuff going on here. All kinds of people on this boat. Uh, in the part before our text for today, Paul warns them about the weather. He says, guys, it's not a good idea, but... You know, sometimes uh, the almighty dollar uh, takes precedence, and these the boat captain is like, no, we got to go. And then they run into a horrible storm, and Paul's like, guys, I, I, I told you, you, you should have listened to me, but I have some good news for you here. We're going to make it. 
An angel has told me the Lord has got a plan for me and he's going to spare all of you guys too. You're along for the ride. So it's not going to be easy, but hang in there and we're going to make it. And at one point, some of the uh, people on the boat uh, want to make a, a quick getaway. And uh, Paul says, don't even think about it. You know, they were like, yeah, we're just going to kind of lower this boat here and lower and uh, es escape. You know, I think of the Titanic, the, the lifeboats. Uh, we're just going to like lower this here and, and uh, relieve some of our weight. You know, they're planning a fast getaway. And Paul's like, don't even think about it. If you do that, I will not guarantee your safety. You know, I'm, I'm giving you guys the assurance you're going to make it. But if you go against... Uh, you know, if you get off the boat, you're dead. And uh, to their credit and to their to their salvation, they listen to Paul and stay on the boat. Later on, as the boat actually does get wrecked, which Paul said would happen, he said, guys, we're going to make it, but the boat is uh, it's on its last legs here. We're going to lose the boat. And sure enough, the boat does uh, become uh, rubble and... In which case, in some cases, they're able to float on that. The people who can't swim, the boat saves them and brings them to land. Uh, at, at that point, when the boat was wrecked, um, the stern was being broken up by the surf, it says. <clears throat> the soldiers were going to kill the prisoners uh, if because they didn't want any to escape. If any escape, that, that's on them, and that's their life that, uh, that is demanded. But the centurion who's in charge of all the soldiers, he took a liking to Paul. He says, all right, we're buds. Uh, and he didn't want Paul to die, and so he told the, the soldiers not to kill any of the prisoners. The other prisoners are all saved, and they all make it for land. Some swim to land. Some are just drifting along on those planks. They make it to the island of Malta, where there's a, an interesting story to be told after uh after that, but you can read that one on your own. But uh, that's that's the story today. So, what uh, what's the allegory here? In the Bible, ships represent the church. Several occasions, you're going back to Noah's Ark, a place where God's people are gathered to be safe against the storms, against the wind and the waves, against the raging of the devil, against the power of sin. There, there are safe places that God has decreed. And the boat is that safe place. The church is that safe place. It is in the church when you are surrounded by the community of God, the company of uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, the word of God which permeates the church, in fact, creates the church and holds the church together. The minute we neglect the Word of God, the minute we quit reading the Bible and talking about what the Bible says, then that's the minute we stop being a church. You can't have the church without the pure gospel. And, the, and that Word also keeps us safe. It forgives our sins. It cleanses us. It, uh, and, it, and it binds us together. So stay in the boat. The storm is nasty and it's not easy. And it's not easy in the boat either, is it? You know, they're, they're having their troubles in the boat. Interesting, though, they got to throw some stuff overboard, right? They don't throw people overboard, but they do have to jettison some cargo. As we think about our lives, are there things we need to jettison? Are there idols that, uh, that would actually cause our boat to sink? Yeah, if they don't get rid of this cargo, they die. They get drowned. They go under the, the, the currents. What are the things in our life we need to jettison? What is the cargo? That... that Answer might be different for every person, but throughout the course of a life, every single one of us has things we need to, to jettison, things we need to get off the boat because they're only going to drag us down. So, and, and within the church, there are things we, we need to, to dispense with. And, and so they, they get rid of the cargo. Their other problem here is that they, they neglect eating. And Paul is like, guys, uh, take some food here. And Paul does a, a little bit of a prayer before he passes out the food and gives it to the 276 people on the boat. Yeah, this is not communion. These are not uh, all Christians on the boat, but it is a, a bit of a fellowship meal, which points to the fellowship meal that we do have in church. 
Yeah, we have the Lord's Supper together, and it is this meal, that nourishment that we need. We can't get through life. And I realize there are people who don't take communion in their life who look like they're doing pretty good. They're not. <laughs> we need nourishment. You know, these people go two weeks without food. Sometimes people go years and years without the body and blood of the Lord. But it's it's here for us because we can't do it. We need that nourishment from above. Um, I, I think there also is a first article aspect to this, to take care of oneself and one's body. Uh, many people do try to push themselves to the extremes in life, but uh, Paul says we we, we got a storm we're fighting, but we're going to be of no use to anybody if we don't take care of ourselves and our physical needs. So so the the people have a community, even though they're much they're a very diverse group on this boat here with the prisoners, the soldiers, the merchants. Hey, that's kind of like church too, isn't it? We have a, a diverse group in, in any church, and and if and to the extent we don't, we need to figure out how to increase our diversity and and make sure we have people of uh, of all all kinds who who uh, who come into this boat that where we get safety and we get protection. So, um, the other the other thing, um, as as the the so stay in the boat. You know, the people who want to jump off the boat and, and get in the escape boats, and, and Paul says, if you do that, you will die. Yeah, that's a, that's a warning we'd give to anyone who leaves church. If you do this, you will die. <laughs> we have to try to do that in ways that are helpful. We have to give that warning in ways that will encourage and not discourage, but um, that's the harsh and true reality of it. If you leave this boat, you will die. Uh Let's see, what else? Um, so See the allegory here. See how this all kind of represents our, our Christian life. The difficulties and the challenges, and the ship gets it's busted up. I mean, yeah, I don't know how to, how to allegorize that. I'm not suggesting our, our church will end up shipwrecked. But even the remnants of the boat are used to save. You've got that wood. Does the wood of the boat, as the people are, are holding on to this plank of wood, and they're being carried to shore. Is this the cross of Christ and holy baptism at once? See, this is where it gets kind of dangerous to allegorize. Yeah, we can maybe make maybe that's too big of a stretch, but I don't know. Wood in the Bible often points to the cross. And what does this wood of this ship do? It saves the people. And the people are saved through water. They go through water to get to a new life on new on land. What does baptism do? Um, hey, sorry if I'm take, pushing this too far. I see some good allegory here. So uh, let's see, what else here? Um, so we, yeah, we got it all, right? Baptism, Lord's Supper, community, church, the storm, the cargo. Uh, all of these things stand for, for, uh, for aspects of our life today. Uh, yeah, stand away from the rocks. What are the rocks? <laughs> we could, we could, we could maybe go all day on this, right? But there is also one other part of this allegory which I think is absolutely a huge uh, thing to recognize. Paul is saved because God has plans for Paul. Notice though that Paul's salvation, God's plans for Paul, the blessings that God has in store for Paul extend beyond Paul. Paul, he has this attitude in the boat, like, hey guys, we're going to be all right. Hang in there. The reason we're going to be all right is because I have been assured that I am going to be all right. And God has assured me that because I'm going to be all right, he's taken you guys along for the ride with me. You're going to be all right too. What did the people on the boat do to be saved? Nothing except they had the good fortune, the grace of God put them on the same boat as Paul. If Paul's not on that boat, they die. And even then, the other prisoners, who are prisoners? What do they represent? People who, you know, they're, they are condemned. They are condemned people who have done bad things. Paul hasn't done anything bad to get his condemnation, but, oh, gee, does that, uh, does that story tell us anything? Is it, do you know anyone else who didn't do anything bad but became condemned? And then his condemnation actually saves other people who were condemned. 
Yeah, if you don't know about that story, we're going to be telling it on a week coming up we call Holy Week, on a day we call Good Friday. <laughs> Paul does represent Christ here in what Christ does. All these people are saved. You know, the, even the centurion here, I see this as an allegory for God the Father. The centurion is willing to let those other prisoners die, but he doesn't want Paul to die because he loves Paul or cares about Paul. So he gives this blanket order that all the prisoners should be saved. God the Father favors his son. He loves Jesus. And because of Jesus, God gives this blanket grace to anybody who is connected to Jesus. If you are connected to Paul on this boat, you're a prisoner like him, you are not condemned. If you are connected to Jesus, you are not condemned. Hey, anyone who tells me there's no allegory in this story here, I'm... I'm, uh, I'm going to have to agree to disagree with you because I, I see it everywhere. So, yeah, uh, and, and lots of good stuff here. I guess that's enough here. Uh, that, enough allegory to get you going all day. <clears throat> so uh, what does the story tell us about who God is and his mercies? This is a story of grace. The people on the boat, they do end up working hard. you know. And if they don't work on that boat and they don't jettison cargo, they die. But it's still all grace, right? They're saved because of grace, and this is the way God saves us. <clears throat> we, we are not saved by our own work or by our own merits. We are saved purely by the salvation that God gives to us by grace through Christ. <clears throat> what does the story tell us about who we are as God's people? We are people who have been placed on a boat. All different people in this boat, but we are people who have been put <clears throat> on a boat together in order that we might be kept safe, from the wind, the waves, the storm, and ultimately the shipwrecks. And finally, what does the story tell us about how to live as God's people? Eat, <laughs> stay in the boat, don't leave church, or you will die. And also, uh, when you are on this boat, take heart. You know, this is something Paul says, guys, we're going to make it. We're going to be okay. Got to work hard, and I know we're against the wind and the waves. You might not even be able to swim, and you just might have to hold on to that plank, hold on to the cross of Christ with your with everything you got, but you're going to be okay. Be of a good cheer as you possibly can be <clears throat> in the midst of an ugly storm. You are going to be okay. You're going to make it. We have a message from God. You're going to make it. That's our story this week. God bless you as we... Uh, Finish off the book of Acts this week and get ready for Holy Week.